Hey everybody, can you hear us okay, yeah? Um, thanks very much for that introduction, Olivia. Um, my title, which was up on the board there earlier on, is a little bit hard, hard to say, so I've actually changed it myself. I'm not just application modernization specialist, make it a little bit easier to talk about. But the important note there is I actually, I do work with customers a lot, enterprise customers, most of our enterprise customers in Ireland, and help them transition their workloads to the cloud. And everything that, in, that involves, whether it's, you know, rehost, uh, just lifting and shifting all the way to modernization. Yeah. And Mike? And uh, my name is Mike Myers, so get the jokes out of the way. Mike, <laughs> yeah. Dr. Evil, I've heard them all before, right? Um, my role is a cloud solution architect, so very similar to what um, Ray does. I work with a lot of um, major companies around cloud adoption um, and software architectures as well. Okay. Right. Cool. Thanks, Mike. So, and, and the agenda in this, so we, when we, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a bit of an idea of what understanding what serverless is um, and what you can use it for, and then learn what we've got available in the Azure platform for the serverless capabilities. So I suppose the first question is, what is serverless? Right? So it's, it's a fairly, it's, it's a new term that, well, it's not that new, but it's been, it's been used a lot more often now. Um, and the idea behind it is, it's, it's, you know, no matter what we say, there's, there's still servers there. It's just that you don't have to manage them. You don't have to care about scaling them. Uh, you don't have to care about the, the underlying infrastructure of them. You basically, it allows developers to, to focus on what they should be doing, what they think about doing, building the applications, building scalable applications without one, wondering how it's going to scale and how it's going to be managed. The important thing about there is for the likes of uh, IDC, IDC and Forrester, so what the market is saying is saying that serverless is actually, it's, it's becoming really popular and most enterprise businesses around the world are going to start to adopt it a lot more over the next couple of years. So it's a kind of a transition from, you know, very recently we had the adoption of microservices and everybody was using microservices a lot. So this is kind of the next step on. It's more of a, a like a nano services or a function as a service. So it's even smaller than a microservice. So it's a small piece of something that does, does it, but does it very well. And it's handled in, independently and, and can scale on its own. So some of the, some of the uh, functionality that we have in, in Azure to, to, to help with the serverless, uh, serverless principles of service methodology, when we start to talk with customers, and start, I'm working with customers all the time about this, and, and some of them you know, are already well on their cloud adoption journey, and some of them haven't done anything with it at all. But we start to talk about the lift and shift, and you move towards the, the top end of this, of this graph, that's where you're going to get the most benefit of using something that's in the cloud. So that's your software as a service offering the likes of Power Apps or Office 365 or uh, Microsoft 365 or whatever it is. But at the start of the bottom of the journey, you talk about infrastructure as a service, and that's Windows or Linux, open source, whatever it is. And you, you can talk about re-hosting re or re -hosting your applications in a cloud platform. When you move further up, you start to th think about the, the containerization of those solutions and what we've got available in Azure for that, so the container instances, Kubernetes services, the app, the app service, and, and service fabric. And then you move up to more the modernized function of what we've got for the serverless capabilities, so your Azure functions and your event grid, and into logic apps, and then we've got power apps at the top of it. And on the right-hand side, then you've got uh, your, for your automation, you've got your event grid, actual functions, and logic apps. So I'll go into each one of these a little bit later on, or a little bit more, but it's important to actually to think about services, serverless is not just functions. It's not just something that sits there and you can action it. There's a lot of services that we have available in Azure that help uh, the, the, help the, uh, the serverless journey, and one of them is, is storage. Um, one thing just before I go, into, uh, I go into each one of these, how many in the room, how many people in the room are actually using Azure at all? Let me just give it a hands up on that. So I'd say well less than half. So you might know that all this capability is there and it's, it, it, they're serverless functions effectively. You can use them uh, as, in, as you need. So with storage, you can use it for unstructured or structured data um, or, or files or queues. Of, and they can, they can underpin any of your applications. There's a quite, a, quite a good few services here, so I'm going to fly through them. What I, what I, should, I, I meant to say earlier on, this is about the, what is serverless. 
Mike is going to go into uh, why you would use it and how you would use it a little bit more as well. So this is just giving you an idea of what we've got available and, and what is actually serverless itself. Azure Cosmos DB, um, Azure Cosmos DB is a brilliant service. So it's, it's, it's a, um, it was the, it's, the, it's the move on from Document DB. If anybody had used Document DB, but it, it's a, uh, it's a multi, multi channel, multi scale, multi application. With basically, there's multiple APIs available. You choose what you want to use. So you can use either a Graph API, Document DB, um, Document DB Graph API columns or uh, key value pairs, and you can use whatever you want to choose, whatever you want to use. But the most important part to this is it's truly global. First, truly global application, but more importantly, it's truly global database. More, more importantly, it's multi-master. So that can be mastered. You can master the database in Australia or in the US or whatever, but you can also master the database in Dublin or Amsterdam or wherever you want to do in your region. And Cosmos DB manages the synchronization all in the background. So you can, ha you can bring the da data as close to, the, to your customers as is, as is needed using Azure Cosmos DB. One of the things that we're seeing working with a lot of customers is that you know, when you talk about global solutions, a truly global solution, Cosmos DB plays part of that. Um, so when we talk about having a data center in, say, Europe, a data center in the US or in Asia, Cosmos DB tends to underpin that and underpin the service that, that will actually use that. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Um, Azure Active Directory. Um, so these are synchronization of your of your on-premises uh, Active Directory for authentic authentication for your application in the cloud, and and that you know that synchronizes your 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 users directly to Azure, so you can use that. And there's multiple services in there, so your Azure Active Directory, your uh, Azure Active Directory B two B and B two C as well. So they're all available as part of that, so you can use them as for all your authentication. Event Grid. So Event Grid is is a simple way of of managing events from any source to any destination. So it's a, it's a very powerful tool um, and it's fully managed as well. Um, Service, Bus, Service Bus is also a communication tool that underpins that you know, a, lot of, a lot of enterprise customers that we're working with at the moment use it. it. Some of the very important things there that you don't get in storage, storage has its queues as well, but the likes of Service Bus, you get your first in, first out, as out of the box as part of your service queue. And you can use it to decouple your application. So it's, it really, it really f falls into the serverless architecture as well. Um, Logic, apps, Logic Apps allows you to build uh, simple workflows for your applications. If you haven't seen workflows, if you haven't tried it, have a go at it. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, drag and drop interface, but there, there's thousands of connections there that you can use to pull in like things like uh, cognitive services, which I'll talk about in a second. But it's it's a very it's a powerful tool that is there that you can pull in as part of the. It's, it's very similar to like a fourth a fourth generation tool. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me a bit like BizTalk, the orchestration engine there. Yeah. Um, so it's really for integration. Yeah. Um, API management as well. So um, when you want to monetize your data or your services, but also bring channels out to your customers. You can use API management for that. I know I'm flying through these, there are a lot of services, but I wanted to give you the idea of the breadth of the services that we have available. The function proxies. Function proxies allows you to uh, manage your APIs, but it also has a, 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 mono, a, a, a separate billable service as part of it. But it's a, it's a kind of a, a smaller version of API management, so it's like API management light, but for your functions as well. Um, stream, stream analytics. Stream analytics, you can do parallel, multiple parallel streams of information from uh, non-IoT or IoT, IoT devices or services and um, use a simple query SQL language, simple query, like, SQL query-like language for uh, querying those, the, the analytics out of that. Um, event hubs is is a hub for that can be used for big data, big big data streaming and event event processing. Um, it can handle millions millions of of messages per second. So it's a, it's a very very powerful service. Yeah, and the key, the key thing on event hubs is that it's designed with maximum IOPS. So it's designed for high volumes of data. 
And what, what we'll see when we go later into some of these slides, there's a lot of these services, the challenge tends to be which service do I actually use? Because each of these services will have its own guarantee and you should, you know, its own SLA, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, we'll go into that later on. Cool. So the bot service, uh, there's a lot of talk about bots now at the moment, but the bot service is a completely, it's a, it's a complete environment that you have available for building your bots so you can build them, test them, automate them, deploy them as part of this service. Um, so it's a, it's a really powerful service and it's really easy to use as well. There's lots of tutorials there available that you can use it. Cognitive services is probably one of my favorite, favorite services part of the serverless technology. So you, you can build intelligent algorithms to infuse into your applications very simply that can listen, um, that can see, can speak, and, and can, can understand your, uh, your technology and understand what you're putting through your application and give you some real-time analysis around that, some kind of cog um, uh, e -D, uh, I'm trying to think of the sentiment analysis is one of the things that I've used a lot, just monitoring text that's coming in and basically how, how positive or how negative was that, and then you can use that to do something with, with a function later on. Azure Functions. So a lot of people, when you talk about Azure serverless components, Functions is the only thing that comes to mind. So I've talked about all the other things, but Functions is really important as well. Functions is probably it's, it's one of the bigger areas. So it's a complete... Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's something that you can deploy to, to the cloud, but it's, it's completely independent, it can scale independently, and it does a simple piece of action or a, you know, a fairly complicated action, and I'll show you in a second how you would implement them. But it, it can be used from anywhere. It can be used, it can be used from any of your API services or, or calling it from applications or event-driven sources directly from something that landed in OneDrive or something that lands in Event Hub or whatever else. Um, so the function, function as a service has been adopted out of the serverless technology term. So these are important parts that we talk about when we talk about the serverless functions as well. Um, the, uh, you've got a single responsibility, they're short-lived, so they do something and do it really quickly and move on. Um, they're completely stateless, but they're, they're event-driven and independently scalable as well. Some of the ways that you can run these, um, so you can use it as consumption, so every time it's fired it just consumes for however long it's running. Um, an important thing to note here as well, you can use any language you want. It doesn't matter what you use, whether it's Windows or, Linux or any of the underpinning technologies, it doesn't matter what you use. App service plan, so app service plan you would use for deploying your web application or API or mobile apps, but you can also use that for functions as well. So if you've got a long run an application, you can use and that. It's worth kind of, before we go on, just highlighting the difference between the two. Yeah. The, con the consumption side is really where the function, you only pay for the time, the execution time of that function. Where previously when you were building applications, you had to deploy the application, put it on a VM, you pay for the, the, the full consumption of that virtual machine 24-7. Where now when you move to that consumption model from a serverless thing, you only pay for a couple of milliseconds of consumption. So if you architect your systems correctly, you reduce the cost. Okay? Now, the other model is where we move to an app service plan where you may need to have something that's long running. So think about building a, ser a, 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 a service itself that has to be long running. That's where you would use the app service plan. Because you're in that, you're running against the virtual machine, so you're paying 24 seven for that one. So the way you architect the system, software architecture plays a big part on your consumption. Thanks, Mike. And app service environment is, a, is another, is another capability of running your service function, serverless functions as well. But it, the important part about this is it's, it's network isolation. It's completely dedicated to cloud environment. So if you need to keep running completely separate, so um, in your own uh, VNet and subnet and lock it down that way, you can use your app service environment for that. Azure Stack. So Azure Stack is our on-premises version of Azure. Um, you can, it's, it's hardware that you deploy to your on-premises network and most of the services that you've got in the Azure cloud is available on Azure Stack. Uh, they're slightly behind the, the, the current version of what we've got in the Azure cloud but I'll, and, that's, and that's intentional and they always will be. So, but it's a it's really important service for, for running uh, completely isolated environments. If you have a contractual 
something, you have a contractual application that you can't push something to the public cloud, you can still get the cloud capabilities but run it on-premises. Some of the, some of the uses of that are like cruise ships or oil rigs or whatever like yeah. that, so they're completely isolated. Um, Azure Functions runtime, Mike, do you want to mention a bit about that? Yeah, um, so basically it allows you basically to run it on a lo local, local server, so you can run it locally um, without, a, without a consuming on the cloud, it's without a consuming on the cloud, so therefore you can reduce the cost. If you move to the next bit there, Ray, this is similar to the IoT Edge. The IoT Edge is, in, is important, right? When you're building IoT systems, it tends to be the devices send a message to the back end, the Azure side, where a function will kick in. That's where you start consumer. What we're actually showing here is that the functions can actually run on the device. So that means if you want to do any pre-processing, you can use pre-processing on the device before it even hits the cloud, that way reducing cost. Yeah. So what the message across all of these, this stack is showing that there's different options, there's different way of architecting your system, and again, if you architect it correctly, you can reduce the cost. IoT Edge, it's a, there's, a, there's a massive uptake on the IoT Edge because you think about all the IoT devices, they're constantly streaming data to the cloud, constantly streaming data. But previously, before IoT Edge, they weren't doing anything smart with that data. They were pushing it up and the cloud had to do all the crunching on it. But now you can use the likes of Azure Functions to do some of the crunching locally on the device and then push it up after you've done that. So it's, it's a really important message and, and there's a lot of uptake on that. Yeah, and what we're kind of seeing with particularly the IoT space, is that the devices are quite smart, that they actually have microservices on the devices themselves yeah. and functions and so forth, so quite clever. And some of the ways to write uh, functions, so in the Azure portal, Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio, IntelliJ, again, most important, like the important thing is it doesn't matter. If you're a C-sharp developer or a Java developer or whatever language you want to use, bring it, you can use it, you can create your functions to do. Okay, so why and when should you use functions, Mike? Okay, so um, typically the way you need to look at the serverless architecture is like when you need to have something that is going to respond to an event. It tends to be the two typical architectures you will use with, the, with this tends to be event-driven architectures or APIs, you're building out APIs. Um, you need to think about the serverless architectures as falling under the functions for the most part, although there is other services we listed there, right? Because we're at the functions level, we need to think of it as we had servers, services, then we had microservices. Functions fall into the nano services model. So it's breaking that microservice down even smaller, right? And because you've broken it down even smaller, those functions are event driven and only, you only pay for when those functions work, okay? If it's in that consumption model, okay? Another thing to understand is that when you don't need uh, full control of your underlying system for a task. So in other words, you know, you're passing it off, it's almost like a fire and forget model. You fire it off, you let it do whatever it does, and maybe there's a callback happening or something else, right? It's very much an asynchronous programming model, okay? Um, and you need to accept some very, uh, some um, thing in latency there, right? So obviously, understand that it's a fire and forget model, that's the way it should be designed. It's an asynchronous model by nature. Um, some of this, here's some of the, the scenarios we see where people use this. So web application backends where you're building it, you know, an API, um, you have a consuming application talking to an API, similar to mobile, mobile devices, Android, iOS, talking to a backend where functions are going to kick off. IoT, big, big for us, this is, um, functions tend to be used that quite, quite a lot on that. Conversation bot using the bot framework, we have our own bot framework. Um, file processing, real-time stream analytics, um, and then automation. You t so when you build out solutions with any cloud provider, you want to build a solution, you're going to get it working, and then you may need to do some automated tasks around the upkeep of maybe that environment or the application. Functions as well can be used as part of this process, okay? And what I just want to show you is just some of the sample architectures of how you would use this. Um, this is just an example here showing a web page which basically calls into a webhook, okay? 
At that point, what actually happens is that webhook is firing off some code. The code is executing. It's maybe calling against the SQL database, the Cosmos DB, doing some action, some CRUD operation, gets the data, returns back the results, okay, and then the page is consumed at that point. Now, from a how would that look in Azure perspective, that function will be completely hosted in Azure in a consumption model, because you're only paying for that just to run. It's not a long running, running option there at all. So you'd only have to, you know, you'd fire off the function, and the web application would just be in an app service model. So the costing of that would actually be quite cheap. Um, IoT, this is a typical IoT solution. IoT systems by nature are very complex. Um, I know that I've been involved in a few of them. They take a long time. Um, but at the basic, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about some sort of a device or maybe a mobile application sending data into Azure. Typically, that comes in through stream analytics. That consumes the data. It performs some action on that data and pushes it out to some action to happen. What's actually happening here is it's sending it out to an, a, a function which is acting as a trigger. The function does some operation on the data, talks to Cosmic DB, and obviously push the data wherever it needs to be, or an ax. So that typical scenario, and that may be command and control to turn on a heater or something like that. Um, this is a typical SaaS integration. It can work with, in this example, we're showing how you can send in an Excel spreadsheet, save it up to OneDrive, okay? Function is listening on that, on the location. Function kicks off does something against the graph API, modifies the data in the spreadsheet, and then puts it back into, uh, adds some graphs or whatever, and puts it back in the location, send an email, tell the person it's ready there at that point, okay? And this is just an example here. This is one we see. We actually have this as a dedicated scenario. A lot of times when you're using these, we do um, shortcut scenarios where we will build some of the code for you. This is one of those. So a lot of times you have to store an image and break it down into smaller images. So whether you're displaying it in your product catalog, in an e-commerce site, this, this is shown how this, how this happens. So basically the image is sent from a mobile device, function kicks off, puts it into a blob storage, just to store, store the image. Function, another function then takes the blob storage in an asynchronous manner, modifies it, saves it as multiple file versions at that point, and then we're done, all right? So the point is, what you're seeing in this one is you can see that we have functions, multiple functions working. So the danger you may face when we're using serverless and using functions particularly is that you over-engineer your software architectures with too many functions, and it becomes a bit of a spaghetti junction. So I'd strongly advise you make sure you get your architecture right and you don't do too many functions, okay? If you can manage them, great, but just, just be careful. That's more a software design thing. So the two architectures I want to talk about is, the two key ones, is the event processing architecture. And this is the one we see all the time. Where basically we're coming from some source, kicking into an event broker, and typically that tends to be either an event, an IoT hub, for a, an event doesn't always have to be with an IoT system. Event hubs tend to get used quite a bit. Um, maybe a service bus or a queue, you're responding there. Maybe a storage queue or an event grid or HTTP process, okay? Point is, this sits in, in most of your software architectures. A lot of these scenarios. I can think of hundreds of, these, hundreds of reasons why you would use that. But fundamentally, what's happening is it's kicking into an Azure function which will talk to a destination at that point. You do something, you enact on it, okay? So an event process and architecture. Some of the key considerations here is that each of the sources that you use from the previous slide there, they do all have different guarantees and they are designed to do certain things. So you do need to understand that some of the services may look the same, but they are aimed at a particular scenario. So in other words, don't get confused between using queues and say, using an event hub. An event hub, as I mentioned earlier, is designed for, for IoT, is for um, fast IOPS, where something like a storage table or a storage queue is not designed for that. It's got a restriction of about 20,000 um, requests per second, where that wouldn't be on an event hub. So it's, you need to understand the services you're using and understand the SLAs associated with each of these as well. Just counts the time here. Um, 
The other one I want to talk about is the serverless API. And this is what we're seeing most customers doing. I actually don't think of any customers not building some sort of an API. And what's happening is they've moved from the SOA world and now they're into the microservices world. Everyone's doing microservices and they're doing either Kubernetes or they're doing service fabric of some sort and everyone's doing containers. That's what a marketplace is at the moment. But you can see where it's going. The next step beyond containers is the serverless architectures. And the service architectures, the microservices, the, the nano services. And that's where we build these out with multiple functions together. The challenges will always be the maintenance of these functions, right? That's software design. But when you get into this architecture, what really is key is this, is our API management. Is anyone using any API management tools at the moment? Yeah, so I strong, strongly advise that you get into API management because it's providing an ecosystem for those APIs. And typically, so it provides services like authentication, uh, policy, traffic routing, um, monitoring, versioning of these nano services, these functions, right? Documentation, the, the swagger documentation. It also will do stuff like Maybe one customer wants this function to return data in XML form, another one wants it in CSV. It'll do that transformation for you as well. Okay? Now, there's multiple products out there. There's MuleSoft, there is our API, API management. Apogee. Yeah, uh, Apogee. Apogee as well. Loads of these products, right? But certainly it is key to, to a successful software architecture around this. Okay? Um, with that, what I just want to highlight is some of the case studies where we've actually done this. Um, if we have a marketing case study site and a technical case study site, the technical case studies are actually quite good because they actually will have Git repositories. There's sort of an awful lot of samples there. Um, there is a lot of core <coughs> libraries here, some basic serverless bits there for Studio as well. And there is an additional link I will send out um, which is around a microservices architecture, a reference architecture where it uses functions as well. And we provide all the code to use in either um, Service Fabric or else Kubernetes as well. So we'll amend this slide and put that link on. Yeah, they're available on the, on the reference architectures we have on the Microsoft documentation anyway. So if you search for it, you'll find it very easily. And just, I suppose, as the last closing comment on this, if you're not looking at serverless, please do. It is the future. Customers are moving to it. Um, it'll reduce your cost. It reduces your spend, and also reduces the maintenance and uptime problems you may may face. Okay. This. Thank you very much.